Okay, welcome to our Friday Arif Shabbat Parasha class, Parashat Emor. The victim and the perpetrator. How does the Torah look at those two characters, especially in the context of a world that we live in that has maybe somewhat of a distorted vision and perspective as to, first of all, who is the victim and the perpetrator, mm -hmm. and as to how we uh, go about treating them and uh, what we should expect of them. At the end of our parasha, there's an episode that demonstrates just those lessons. So the parasha, which deals in the beginning, of course, of the laws of the Kohanim, and middle towards the rest of the parasha, almost, the laws of the holidays, and we read this parasha for that reason on the holidays, ends just about with a certain difficult, surprising, uh, and somewhat confusing episode. Without um, saying about it, let's just dive right into the Pesukim and ask some very necessary questions as we go. So you're following along in Parashat Imor, we're in Perek Kafdalah chapter 24, Pasuk Yud, verse 10. And this really episode occurs out of nowhere. The Torah has been, for the last handful of parashiot, simply conveying laws. There has not really been a storyline, as there is barely any storyline in the entire book of Vayikra. But here's an episode that comes up as Am Yisraela sojourning in the desert. ben Isha Yisraeli, ben Ish Misri, betoch b'nei Yisrael. It says the son of a Jewish woman who is, and he is, the son of an Egyptian man went out in the midst of B'nai Israel, in the midst of the people. And then they, all of a sudden we change from singular to plural, they, there's another character here, fought in the midst of the camp. Who fought? The son of the Jewish woman with the man, Hayisraeli, who is Jewish, or maybe it means the son of the Jewish man. And then, Pasuk Yeralev, Vayikov ben Isha Yisraeli et Hashem by Kalel. It says that the son of the Jewish woman cursed, Vayikov is a, is, a, is a word that describes both the pronouncing in a negative manner and cursing, and it follows with that synonym by Kalel of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Has Shalom. But basically, he cursed God. Some say with Hashem Hemeforash, which is the explicit name of God of which we're not aware, or possibly, as according to the Rambam, Amonai is Yudke Vavke is also at the same, uh, the equivalent severity of violation in terms of cursing God with that name, um, and could be um, one of what's called the kinuyim or the nickname of God's uh, of Hashem's either or. That's what he did. But yeah, Bihu toed Moshe. So apparently some, they made a citizen's arrest and they took him to Moshe Rabbeinu. Hashem and Moshe will meet about the debris of Malkedan. Now we get some identification at the end of the episode. Um, his mother's name. Shilmi bat debri, they're from the tribe of Dan. And they kept, they were kept in, uh, kept, he was kept in prison uh, in order to get explicit instructions from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So it was brought to Moshe Rabbeinu. And apparently Moshe Rabbeinu was not, for whatever reason, aware, proficient, knowledgeable in the, the law and the consequences and the the protocol that one must go through when someone is in, uh, guilty of such a violation. And therefore, he put, held him in abeyance in, in prison until he had a conversation with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We see this later on in Parashat Shalach, a similar episode, a similar, um, uh, let's say, consultation with the person who gathered the, the wood in the desert. Um, but here, it seems like Moshe Rabbeinu was in the dark in terms of 
the consequence of the punishment, what are the ramifications of this activity? But the Benadol HaMashiach, the Lord Hashem told him, bring him outside the encampment, that person who cursed. And all those who heard him um, verbalize that terrible statement should put their hands on his head. And everyone should stone him. And then Bnei Israel should be told that anyone who curses Hashem is punishable by death by stoning. Okay, let's retreat, look back, and inquire the necessary inquiries and make the necessary analysis of the story. First, just let's look at the terminology. It says, Vayese, this person went out. And the end of the pasuk says, Betoch. Inside, he went out inside the Mahana or inside amongst Am Yisrael. So there is a little contrast in what he did. He did he go out or in or both? What's that combined term supposed to be telling us? What actually happened over here? He went out, maybe that means he went in public. Um, but what is Betoch ben Israel? He's living among Am Yisrael. So, what scene is that really describing amidst Am Yisrael? It then says, and they fought Bamahane in the camp. How did that look? Now you notice here we have, even though at the end, one of the parties' mother's names was identified. Otherwise, um, where the Torah is identifying them in a very unusual manner. It's by their lineage. And not only that, when we were introduced to the, we'll call him right now the perpetrator, because he, he sinned obviously with cursing Kadosh uh, Baruch Um the way it was described is also not just in a single lineage description. It's Ben Isha Yisrael, Yisraeli, the son of the Jewish mother, Behu Ben Ish Misri. And he is the son of a Egyptian man. That word Behu is completely superfluous because if you were wanted to describe who this person is by his parents, you would just say he's the son of a Jewish woman and an Egyptian man, a mixed marriage. Um, but instead it said, he is the son of the Jewish woman, and he is the son of, of an Egyptian man. Superfluous, almost a distinct type of description, as if there is two separate identities that you can give to such a person. And then um, we're told that Moshe Rabbeinu was not aware and of, of the law. Again, we've seen this once before later on in Torah, when Moshe Rabbeinu was not aware. But here, we're actually told by Hachamim that he had no clue whatsoever. In other words, in the episode of the gatherer of wood in the desert in the Parashat Shelah, we're told that he knew he was punishable by death, but didn't know he was Mehalel Shabbat in some way, shape, or form, but didn't know what type of death. Here, the Gemara Sanhedrin explicitly says that he didn't know, Lo forash ma'yasi was not explicit in terms of the consequence, he did not even know if this was at all punishable by death. Moshe Rabbeinu was absolutely in the dark, says the Gemara, what happened to this person. And perhaps we have some clues over here that would tell us why Moshe Rabbeinu was in the dark. Who ben Ish Misri, made because he's half Jewish, so to speak. Is that, you know, a separate set of consequences? Maybe the Torah has asked for compassion for him because of that. Moshe Rabbeinu did not know. How about the more overriding general question? What's, what, what's the story all about? Somebody sinned. Someone got punished for his sin. That's what happens. We have a legal system. I mean, still now had a Torah. So it's cause and effect is reward and punishment. We know that. And this is difficult to hear. Why is it necessary for us to be given an entire text uh, within the Torah that describes the story of a person who sinned and unfortunately he was killed. Is it because um, Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to be wanted? Do we want to really accentuate the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know a law? There's got to be lessons. There's got to be morals. There has to be something that is unique about the story. So let's move on, try to answer some of our questions and provide some facts 
about not only the story, but the actual sin as we go. So this is a serious avon, obviously, cursing God. In fact, of all the capital punishments, um, the only one that requires what's called simichat shadayim, which means to put, uh, as part of the procedure before the person receives his death penalty, putting hands, resting hands, simicha on the person's head, is this sin for some reason? And there is a law in the Gemara codified in Shurhan Aruch that if someone were to hear somebody else perpetrating this sin, cursing God forbid the name of God explicitly, he would be required, according to Halakha, to do qiri'ah, to rip his clothing. Rip your clothing like you would badminan for someone who's deceased, a close relative. Um, even if it was not the explicit name of God, one of these so-called nicknames of Hashem, Elohim, whatever it is, even could be in another language. You'd be saying God, right? Person hears that, they would have to rip their clothing. It's a unique halakha. Um, stoning is the most serious level of capital punishment. So it doesn't, it seems to be serious. On the other hand, saying words doesn't sound like it should be as serious as let's say some of the bigger ones, murder, uh, idolatry, right? Which also have the consequence of capital punishment. Sefer HaChinuch explains as follows. Why is this iniquity so severe? Why is the act so terrible? He says, the words he uses are so I'll just quote you a few of the words. He says, a person is mitroken. A person empties himself. Mitroken ha'adam. Be'ama'amar harahahu. By making this statement, a person takes some of his own humanness away. And the entire, the beauty, the splendor, the glory of his being, of his neshama, he has ruined. He has rendered destruction on it. And really, says the Sefer Ahinu, he's lowered himself to the, to the level of a behemah, of an animal. How so? Because with that same aspect, with the same gift that God distinguished, mankind and behemoth, and that's the gift of intellect and speech, verbalizing that intellect. He used it for the most egregious, low-down uh, act. And God giving him the opportunity to do greatness with his mouth, instead used his ability to talk, um, to distinguish himself as a person that has no bounds whatsoever. A person that not only does not recognize his creator, but curses his creator, spits in the face of his creator. Um, and by that, basically breaking all boundaries, um, the person abused his gift, his intellect, his speech, and to the nth degree in the most extreme way and committed the most disgusting, abominable act in this curse of God um, to which there is nothing under and beneath it. And therefore the severity of the sin and the consequence and the punishment, you can say we don't recognize a more severe punishment perhaps in the Torah, sekila or simichat jadayim. That's how bad what just happened is. Um, so it's bad. And there's no one that can be excused from such an activity. Let's look at some of the terminologies over here and how this person was described. So um, if you will, it was a mixed marriage, right? Terrible woman marries Goy, no good. This person is an innocent victim, seemingly, of that mixed marriage. And Surah tells us that he went betok b'nei Israel. What is that supposed to be describing? Amidst B'nai Israel. So the Rambam, first of all, cites um, the Midrash, where among other Mefarshim do as well. And that says, Israel This teaches us that he converted. What does that mean? He converted. I thought his mother was Jewish. So some say that means that the uh, opinion of Tosafot and some of the French Shonim say that means that because this mixed marriage occurred before Matan Torah and people's practice were at that before Torah was given to follow uh, the person's paternal lineage to determine his uh, status, 
And that means if his father was a goy, he is a goy. So the person kept that status, so to speak, because, you know, uh, unfortunately, he was born before Muhammad al Sinai. And that's when his identity was established, so to speak. Others, like the Ramban, disagrees. No, we have the Torah now. Um, we follow maternal lineage for identity. And therefore, this person is a, is a complete Jew. And so what does it mean in the Midrash then when it says, where Betoch, he went mit b'nei Israel, it means that he uh, converted. It doesn't really mean that he converted. There wasn't a technical need to convert. Rather, it means that he made this conscious decision. His decision was to cling to his Judaism, to stick to his mother's side, not to go with the Ish Misri, the Egyptian father that he had, not to follow in that way. Rather, he went betoch b'nei Israel. Amidst Ben Israel, he stuck to the Jews because he believed and he felt that he was Jewish. And he did his best to retain that identity because he was a full-fledged Jew, according to Halakha. So that means this person, we could already start painting a picture, had somewhat of a struggle. And um, he's kept anonymous. He's kept anonymous, but his identity is not just that of a Jewish woman. The who ish mystery. And he, we repeat, is the son of an Egyptian man, trying to shape desperately that identity his entire life. Um, let's step back for a moment. Make no mistake about it. This person committed, as we said, the most lowly egregious sin almost that a person can commit. We don't absolve him for that. We make no excuses whatsoever. God said stone him. However, perhaps we can backtrack and discover what moves sometimes a person to such terrible sins. And possibly who else shares the guilt collectively besides the sinner himself. And here is this person desperately clinging to Judaism, Betoch Bene Yisrael. He's kept anonymous. The Kliakar says no names are mentioned over here because both he, and the person fighting with him, and why is this person who is a complete Jew, we're told, fighting with him in public? Uh, good question. But both of them lost their prestige by, by, by dueling with each other. They're both guilty. We're not even going to say their name. They lost the, the, the uh, let's say, the, uh, the zechut, the merit to have their names even mentioned. But the Ora Hayim points out something that's absolutely profound based on our understanding that this person who is a Jew struggled with his identity. Let's look again at this term, Betoch ben Israel. And he points out that if he is Betoch, he's amongst, it means he doesn't really have his own secure place to dwell. It means he's wandering amongst the people. They didn't allow him to settle anywhere. He settled here and they said, you're not one of us. We don't want you. You're not from our tribe. He settled there and he said, you're too different. They hassled him. They made him feel beneath his, his, his status. They took away his dignity from him. He was betok ben Israel. He was wandering without really following, finding a home rather without being able to be settled, to feel comfortable, to feel like he's part of the Jewish people. And as the Ora Hayim said, every time he went somewhere, they said, you're not one of us. You don't belong here. You're from an Egyptian father. And his name is not mentioned. And one of the possible reasons is that the fight was exactly not about his name, but about how the Torah identifies him vis-a-vis -vis the other person, the son of an Egyptian man and the son of a Jewish man. And that's exactly why they fought, because his identity was questioned. He was a stranger. He was different. He was not accepted. And someone actually had the nerve to duel him in public to challenge that identity. There were absolutely no excuses for this person to curse. But for ha perhaps we can now track in this episode and other severe situations, what brings a person to sin? In fact, the Midrash says that he is 
Ben Ish Misri, you know who his father was, the Egyptian that Moshe Rabbeinu killed many years ago when he saw him uh, torturing another Jew. And at the time, Moshe killed that person using positively God's explicit names as the Midrash. And perhaps this person as a child remembered all his life, the explicit name of God. One day I'll use it to my advantage. And here he used it in anger, in pushback, in resistance to Hashem, because he couldn't take it anymore. We don't absolve him. We don't acquit him. He's absolutely guilty. But look what brought him to his sin. The who ben ish misri. That's exactly who he is. He's the son of the Egyptian. That's what they called him. That's how they treated him. And that's why they didn't accept him. And that's why there's a separate phraseology in the Torah that identifies him exactly as that. And from this emits stems to major concepts in Judaism, but it's so relevant to a modern world. And you can say even a, a modern, modern political world. One is accountability. One is to say, no matter how a person is victimized, no matter how much he's downtrodden, no matter how much society abuses a person, there's never an excuse for wrongdoing and evil. And Hashem proved it by saying, Hazit the guy has Hazit the guy stoned him to death. It doesn't matter how much you've absorbed in difficulty in terms of your ability to act out based on that uh, bias, based on that oppression that you're, you're uh, unfortunately having to endure does not absolve you from anything. You can't go out and, 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 and riot and ruin property just because you've been victimized. We feel terrible for you, but you've just went from the victim to the perpetrator by committing crimes and using as an excuse your own victimization and your oppression, your difficulty. We no longer feel bad for you anymore. And, and society cannot excuse these activities. A terrorist, even he is really brought up from a terrible uh, 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 society, surrounding in society where which brought him to crime, we can never use some type of distorted moral compass to make excuses to someone killing innocent people because he had a difficult in his upbringing and he's angry about his lifestyle. It doesn't work. Accountability for everything that you do tells us the Torah Kedoshah. And the other critical comment is about bias, something that the world calls today racism, something that's incredibly misunderstood. Bias is not about uh, your, your race, your religion, your ethnicity, skin color, Bias is a simply about a human being created in the image of God being treated unfairly and different than another human being, unexcusably so. This Ish Misri, the son of an Egyptian, what caused him to be persecuted is that he was categorized, forcefully categorized, and treated based on the categorization. We said, you're, you're a son of an Egyptian, you don't belong, this is who you are. And he was made sure to feel that way his entire life. Anybody can be the victim of that. The fact that he was a Ben Ish Misri, that identity doesn't mean that every person that looked at him the wrong way is a racist. But it does mean if someone treated him in a different way because of that category, he was forced into it and then oppressed based on it, that's bias. You want to call it racism? Fine. That's just a, a category, a branch of bias and persecution. The Torah believes that every single human being was created by Sedem Elohim in the image of God. And America got it right when they said in the Constitution, all men were created equal. It's absolutely right. Even Goyim say that Ambam could have a portion if they're righteous enough of Olam Haba. And in modern and recent times, there were attempts um, to, to categorize and, and therefore victimize certain groups. And we call that, you want to call it racism, it's really bias. And um, uh, there are um, many attempts to, so to speak, um, you know, be proportionate in society because a certain type of people had a history of that type of bias. We believe in the Torah looking at every individual 
and looking at the context of what that individual lives in. If he is not right now being treated unfairly, there is no bias right now. We can't justify um, bending over backwards and being unfair just because there's such thing as bias in this person's race. We have to treat him fairly. And if we do, we're doing okay. And we don't have to turn the table and create victimization. We believe that every person deserves fair treatment. All lives matter. And that's not just a political statement. All lives matter. Um, and grouping leads to hatred. Grouping leads to backlash. And uh, it's a shame that in a great righteous country, we've um, you know, become warped in our perspective in terms of who's the victim and who's the perpetrator. Accountability for everyone, nothing excuses evil activity, but yet sensitivity in society to <laughs> never categorizing someone and making him downtrodden based on his category. Two powerful lessons that Torah Kedosha has for all times, of course, but we see definitely and especially in modern times. Amen, amen, shabbat shalom.